Forgotten Soldier, chapter 3, part 2, I think this is, page 91. Uh, we kept passing groups of men waiting for the mud who begged us to pick them up, but we couldn't stop. Toward noon, with our last drop of gas, we reached a town where a unit was being assembled for the front. I escaped becoming an infantryman before my time by a hair's breadth. We had to wait until the following day before we could use the reserve of five gallons of gas, which Ernst was able to draw. We were able to leave with an unexpected, when an unexpected and unpleasant sound struck our ears. In the distance, still quite far away, we heard the booming of big guns. As we thought we were very far from the front now, we were both astonished and alarmed. We didn't know, and I didn't know until much later, that our course had been taking us parallel to the belgorod Korkov line. Nonetheless, after unloading two dying men to make room for three more wounded, we set off without delay. In the middle of that afternoon, everything went wrong again. Our truck was more or less in the middle of a column of ten. We had just passed an army unit whose tanks were looking like a giant version of the slimy creatures that emerge on mud flats at low tide. They must have been on their way to meet the enemy, which seemed to be very close. We could hear artillery on our left, despite the loud, laboring noises of the trucks. Ernst and I exchanged looks. We were stopped by some soldiers who were setting up an anti-tank gun. Dig in, fellows, shouted an officer as we slowed down. Ivan's getting pretty close. This time, at least, they were telling us something. But I wonder how the Russians, who'd been left some 90 miles behind, could already be in this district. Aaron's, who was driving, stepped on the gas. Two other trucks did the same. Suddenly, five planes appeared in the sky at a moderate altitude. I pointed them out to Ernst. They're Soviet yaks, he shouted. Take cover! We were surrounded by bare mud with occasional clumps of stunted brush. There was a sound of machine gun fire from the sky. The column drove more quickly toward a shallow fold in the ground, which might give some protection. I was leaning out the window, trying to see the flying mud spun by our wheels. Two Fokofolfs had appeared and had shot down two of the Russian yaks, which crashed far to the west. Until the final stages of the war, Russian air power was uh, no match for the Luftwaffe. Even in Prussia, the Russian air power was the most active. The appearance of one German Messerschmitt 109 or one German Fokofolf would make a dozen armored Soviet Aleutian bombers turn and run. At this period, the German air power still possessed important reserves. The lot of the Russian pilots was not enviable. Two of the three remaining Russian yaks had taken flight, pursued by our planes, when the last dived straight at the convoy. One of the Fokovolts was chasing him, and he was plainly trying to get him in his sights. We reached the dip of the road. The Soviet planes had come down very low to use its machine guns. The truck ahead of us had stopped short, and the able body were jumping down into the mud. I was already holding the door open, and I jumped, with my feet together, plunging face downward when I heard the machine guns. With my nose in the mud my hands on my head, my eyes instinctively shut, I heard the machine gun and the two planes through a hellish intensity of noise. The sound of racing engines was followed by a loud explosion. I looked up to watch the plane with the black crosses on its wings regain altitude. Three or four hundred yards away, where the Russian yak had crashed, there was a plume of black smoke. Everybody was getting up. One more who won't give us any trouble, shouted a fat corporal who was clearly delighted to still be alive. Several voices cheered for the Luftwaffe. Anybody hit? One of the com non coms called out. Let's get going then. I walked over to the Tatra truck, trying to brush off the worst of the mud that clung to my uniform. I noticed two holes in the doors I had opened to get out with, which appeared to have swung shut on its own momentum. Two round holes, each outlined by a ring of metal from which the paint had been scraped away. Nervously, I pulled open the door. Inside, I saw a man I shall never forget. A man sitting normally on the seat, whose lower face had been reduced to a bloody pulp. Ernst? Ernst? I asked in a choking voice. Ernst! I threw myself at him. Ernst, what? Say something, Ernst! I looked frantically for some features on that horrible face. Ernst? Ernst! I was nearly crying. 
Outside, the column was getting ready to leave. The two trucks behind me were impatiently blowing in their horns. Hey! I ran toward the first of the trucks. Stop! Come with me! I've got a wounded man! I was frantic. The doors of the truck behind me had swung open and two soldiers stuck out their heads. Well, young fellow, are you going to move or what? Stop! I Stop! I shouted louder than ever. I've got a wounded man! We have 30! One of the soldiers shouted back, Get going! The hospital isn't too far from here! Their voices rose over mine, and the noise of the trucks which had pulled out and were passing me drowned my cries of desperation. Now I was alone in, with a Russian truck loaded with wounded men and Ernst Nelbach, who was dead or dying. You shits! Wait for me! Don't go without us! I burst into tears and gave way to a mad impulse. I grabbed my Mauser machine gun, which I'd left in the truck. My eyes were swimming, and I could barely see. I fell for the trigger and pointed the gun at the sky, fired all five cartridges in the magazine, hoping that to someone in the trucks would sound like some sort of cry for help. But no one stopped. The trucks continued to roll away from me, setting off a spray of mud on each side. In despair, I returned to the cabin and ripped open my kit to look for a package of dressing. Ernst, I said, I'm going to bandage you. Don't cry. I was insane. Ernst wasn't crying. I was. His coat was covered with blood. With the dressings in my hand, I stared at my friend. He must have been hit in the lower jaw. His teeth were mixed with fragments of bone, and through the gore I could see the muscles of his face contracting, moving what was left of his features. In a state of near shock, I tried to put the dressing somewhere in the cavernous wound, but this proved impossible. I pushed a needle into the tube of morphine and jabbed ineffectually through the thickness of cloth. Crying like a small boy, I pushed my friend to the other end of the seat, holding him in my arms and soaking in his blood. Two eyes opened up brilliant with anguish and looked at me from his ruined face. Ernst! I laughed through my tears. Ernst! He slowly lifted his hand and put it on my forearm. Half choked with emotion, I started the truck and managed to begin moving without too great a jolt. For a quarter of an hour I drove through a web of ruts with one eye on my friend. His grip on my arm tightened and eased in proportion to his pain, and his death rattle rose and fell, sometimes louder than the noise of the truck. Choking back tears, I prayed without reason or thought, saying anything that came into my head. Save him! Save Ernst God! He believed in you! Save him! Show yourself! But God did not answer my appeals. In the cab of a gray Russian truck, somewhere in the vastness of the Russian hinterland, a man and an adolescent were caught in a desperate struggle. The man struggled with death, the adolescent struggled with despair, which is close to death. And God, who watches everything, did nothing. The breath of the dying man passed with difficulty from that horrible wound, making huge bubbles of blood and saliva. I considered every possibility. I could turn back and look for help or force the men I was carrying to tend to Ernst to, at gunpoint if necessary. Even, I even kill Ernst to cut short his suffering. But I knew very well I couldn't kill him. I had not yet been obliged to fire directly at anyone. My tears had dried, leaving the trace of their passage on my filthy face to betray my weakness to the world. I was no longer crying, and my feverish eyes stared at the knob of the radiator two meters in front of me, which cut hypnotically in the interminable horizon. For long moments, Aaron's hand would tighten on my arm, and each time I was overwhelmed with fresh panic. I couldn't look at that horrifying face. Several German planes passed overhead through the cloudy sky, and in a desperate attempt at telepathy, every fiber of my body appealed to them for help. But maybe they were Russian planes. It didn't matter. I had no time to spare. No time to spare. The expression assumed its full significance, as so many expressions do in wartime. Ernst's hand gripped my arm convulsively. The pressure continued for so long I slid my foot off the accelerator and stopped. Afraid of the worst, I turned and looked at the mutilated face whose eyes seemed to be fixed on something the living can't see. Those eyes were veiled by a curious film. My heart was pumping so hard that I felt actually physical pain. I refused to believe what I could guess without difficulty. Ernst! I shouted back. From the back of the truck, my shout was answered by several others. 
I pushed my companion down on the seat, imploring heaven to let him live, but his body fell heavily against the other side of the cabin. Death. He was dead. Ernst. Mama. Oh, God, help me. In a delirium of tremor, I leaned against the truck door and then let myself drop, trembling onto the running board. I tried to persuade myself that none of this was happening, that it was all a nightmare from which I could wake to see the other horizon. As I sat and thought, I still had no idea the extent of irremediable evil. I dreamt of lo what life would be like when I took off this horrible nightmare in which my friend had just died, but my eyes could see only mud sucking at my boots. Two heads looked out from the back of the truck. They were saying something, but I didn't hear them. I stood up and turned my back on them, walked off in a short distance. That small physical effort reawakened some sense of life and hope, and I tried to tell myself that all this wasn't really serious, that this was only a bad dream, and I had to forget. I tried to impose an expression of smiling derision on my features. Two of the wounded men jumped down from the back of the truck to relieve themselves. I stared at them, unseeing, while the vitality of being alive beat back the darkness. I began to think with hope that surely all the German soldiers in Russia would be sent to help us, that something must be coming to help us. Suddenly I thought of the French. They were already on their way. All the newspapers said so. The first legionnaires had already set out. I had seen the photographs. I felt a hot flesh run through me. Ernst would be avenged. That poor fool who had never hurt a fly, who had spent his time making life more endurable for wretched soldiers shaking with cold in his marvelous hot showers. The French would come, and I would run to embrace them. Ernst had loved them like his own compatriots. This surge of hope and joy could not be damped by facts I didn't know, like the fact that the French had decided on quite another course. What happened? asked one of the men, whose gray bandage was falling over his eyes. Are we out of gas? No, my friend had just been killed. They looked into the cabin. Fuck. That's not so bad. Just, at least he didn't have to suffer. I knew that Aaron's agony had lasted for nearly half an hour. We ought to bury him, one of them said. The three of us lifted out the body, which was already stiffening. I moved like an automaton, and my face was without expression. I saw a r small rise of ground, which was less trampled than everywhere else, and we took errands there. We had no shovels, so we dug the grave with our helmets, rifle butts, and bare hands. I myself collected Aaron's identity tags and papers. The other two were already pushing back the dirt and trampling it down with their boots when I looked my last on that mutilated face. I felt that something had hardened in my spirit forever. Nothing could be worse than this. We pushed on a stick at the head of the grave and hung Ernst's helmet on it. I slit the stick with the point of my bayonet and slid on it a piece of paper torn from the notebook Ernst always carried with him, inscribed naively in French. Ici, j'ai enterré mon ami Ernst Nauberg. Then to forestall another emotional crisis, I turned and ran back to the truck. We started off again. One of the wounded had come up front and taken Aaron's place, a stupid-looking man who fell asleep almost at once. Ten minutes later, the motor coughed and then died. The Joel woke my sleeping companion. Something's wrong with the engine? No, I said in an offhand voice. We're out of gas. Shit. So what do we do? We'll walk. On this nice sunny day, it should be grand. The strongest will have to help the others. My friend's death had abruptly turned me into a cynic, and I felt almost glad that the others would have to suffer with me. My companion looked me up and down. You don't mean that. We can't walk. We're all burning up with fever. His stupid assurance made me furious. He was clearly a half-wit, would never question anything, and had gone to war because he'd been sent. Then a Russian shell had gone off too close, and he'd been pierced, and that is all he felt or knew. Since then, he'd been dozing and stuffing himself with sulfonilamide. Well, you can stay here and wait for help, or for Ivan. I'm clearing out. I ran to the back door, kicked it open, and explained the situation. Inside, it stank. The men were lying in a revolting mess. Some of them didn't even hear me, and I felt ashamed and brutal. What else could there to do? Seven or eight haggard men pulled themselves up. Their faces were amazingly drawn. Shaggy beards sprouted from their lined cheeks, and their eyes burned with fever. I felt sickened and unwilling to insist that they walk. When they climbed down, they discussed the fate of the others. It's impossible to get them up. Let's just leave without telling them. Maybe somebody will be along to help them. They're still coming behind us.
Our wretched group set off, haunted by the dying men we had abandoned in the Chacha truck. But what else could we have done? I was the only man without an injury, an only man with a gun. I'd offered Novak's gun, but nobody wanted to carry it. A short time later, a muddy sidecar caught up with us and stopped, although we hadn't flagged them, and carried two soldiers who belonged to an armored unit, two generous men. One of them decided to give his place to a wounded man, and collect his belongings, got out, and walked with us. Somehow the sidecar managed to take on three wounded, and so once more I had a strong young man to keep me company, whose humane gesture, if nothing else, made him a sympathetic human being. I no longer remember his name, but I do remember that we talked long and deeply about many things. He told me that the Russian offensive had been mounted very suddenly, and that throughout this vast region we might be stopped at any moment by a Russian motorized unit. My throat went dry, but my companion seemed to assure himself of us and our army. We'll resume the offensive now that it's spring. We'll throw the Popoffs back across the Don and then the Volga. It's astonishing how agreeable it is to meet confidence and enthusiasm when, when one is feeling lost. It was as if heaven had sent me this healthy animal to revive my morale. I would like things more if Nobek had still been alive, but one must remain humble and resigned in the face of providence. After all, it was I who should have been driving instead of Nobek. Toward evening, we came to an isolated country farmhouse. We approached cautiously. Uh, the partisan often used places like this. They had the same choice as we did, and for anyone, a roof is a roof. The tall young man who joined us walking out ahead slowly and deliberately with his gun in his hand. For a moment, he disappeared behind the farmyard buildings, and we caught a twinge of anxiety. But he reappeared and waved us on. The farm was inhabited by a group of Russians who did everything they could to make the woman cut him up. The woman cooked us a hot meal. They told us they hated communism. They had been deported from a small farm they'd owned in the neighborhood of Vitebsk to work on the big Kolkosh collective farm we were now walking through. They said they'd often given shelter to German soldiers. They had an amphibious Volkswagen in one of their sheds, which had broken down and been abandoned by one of our sections. They said that the partisans never bothered them because they knew that the Fairmacht often used their buildings. Our tall newcomers felt somewhat uneasy about the Volkswagen. The Russians might be lying. They could have stolen it. We tried to start it, but all that engine turned over the vehicle would not move. We'll fix it tomorrow, the big man said. We ought to rest now. I'll take the first watch, and you can relieve me at midnight. We're going to we're gonna stand watch, I asked in surprise. We have to. You can't trust these people. All Russians are liars. This meant another night of anxiety. I walked to the back of the shed, which was dark. There was a jumble of sacks, sheaves of dried sunflower stalks, ropes, and boards, which were raved as a rough bed. I was about to take off my boots when my companion stopped me. Don't do that. You, you'll never be able to stand them tomorrow. You have to let them dry on your feet. I was on the point of replying that my sodden leather would prevent my feet from drying, but I didn't. What difference did it make if my feet were wet or my boots were wet? I myself were soaked through and filthy and so tired. You should wash your feet, though. This will make you feel fresher and better tomorrow, too. What sort of fellow was this? He was as dirty as I was, but he seemed to be full of will and ardor and spirit, as if nothing fundamental to his being had been damaged. I'm too tired, I said. He laughed. I threw myself down on my back, overcome by exhaustion, which ached in the muscles and the shoulders and the neck. I stared into the shadows, caught by an indefinable fear. Above me, the dusty beams were lost in the darkness. My sleep would lead in and dreamless. Only happy people have nightmares from overheating. For those who live a nightmare reality, sleep is a black hole, lost in time, like death. That is starting page 99. Starting page 99.